This, so we're gonna, this chapter is called definite, the definite integral, okay? And there's two kind of main branches of calculus. Um, and the first one is called differential calculus, which is all about derivatives, which is kind of what, what you uh, learned about for the past couple months or so, right? And the next part is called the integral calculus. And so most of you already know this, that integrals are when you go backwards, right? So differential calculus is all about how things change and how rates of things and all that kind of stuff. And uh, integral calculus is all about finding areas underneath curves and summing yeah. things up, adding them all up. And uh, the two guys, girls, the two guys who kind of were are given credit for developing calculus, who were Newton and Leibniz, Leibniz were, uh, they did differential calculus first, and then they said, oh, look at this. If we, if we go backwards, this turn, we can find the area under curves, and we could solve all kinds of interesting problems, like how far away the planets are, and how fast things are moving in, in space, and all that kind of stuff. So I, apparently, I gave it called calculus came along after uh, differential calculus, and it solved a lot of problems for how things in the universe work and all that kind of thing. All right, so, so for example, say you have a bike rider. A bike rider, I'm gonna start with an example stuff. A bike rider rides, um, rides 17 miles per hour um, from, I don't know, 2 p.m. 2 p.m. till 4 p.m. How far does he go? This is hard. How far does he go? She. How far does she go? Why does it always have to be that? Okay. How far does she go? She could ride 70 miles an hour. 34 miles an hour. How do I figure that out? 17 times 2, right? You know that? Great right times time equals this. Well, it turns out that I can represent that with a, with an area model as well. Um, okay. By, uh, <coughs> let's draw one more line here. By going that, um, here she is, and this is the time, say this is 2 p.m., and this is 4 p.m. and this is time over here, time, and this is velocity, right? And so one way to think about this is if I find the area of this, if this is y equals 17 miles per hour, and this is time goes from 2 to 4, maybe it starts over here, and Maybe she started at noon or something like that. Um, then the, the area under this curve, you understand <coughs> that the area under that curve represents how far she went. Yeah? Because I'm multiplying, I'm finding the area of this rectangle when I, you guys know, it's ray times time equals distance. So if I went for two hours at 17 miles an hour, that could also be represented by a curve like that. Yes? No? Maybe. And that that is this thing right here, this chunk here is called a definite integral. Definite integral. And it's the area under curve. Now, that's not very exciting. You say, why not just multiply those two things together? You know? But what if the bike rider, instead of going you know, straight across like that, what, or going at a constant rate, which usually happens, doesn't happen, right? So maybe she started off, she starts off going zero miles an hour, and then she is picking up speed, and then she kind of goes at a steady rate, then she sees her friend, she goes really fast, and then she's going at a steady rate, then she hits a big hill, and her velocity drops way down, 
and then she gets to the top of the hill, and then she goes faster, 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 and then she coasts home. Okay? So maybe in reality, velocity of this might be her velocity, right? Because it doesn't, you don't ride your bike going steady. There's hills and things and things. You ever gone on a bike ride or something like that? Hold on a minute. Wait for it. And uh, so in reality, her velocity is changing over time. And uh, so say now that I want to know how far she goes from two to four. Can I still just multiply the rate times the time? Yes. Yes? Not really, right? I can't just go. There is a way to do the average rate times the time, which we'll figure out later on. But if I want this chunk of area in here, it would still represent how far she went. Okay, but one way to figure out that chunk is by dividing it up into a bunch of little rectangles, right? So what I might do is take a bunch of rectangles and add them all up. Like I can take this rectangle plus this rectangle, this rectangle. I could approximate this rectangle right here. But you can see that if I did a rectangle right there, oh, that's not a very good rectangle, <laughs> is it? Um, hey, it looks like Christmas there. So. Let me try with just my. So I could do a rectangle right here, maybe. Whoops, I should make a different color. Rectangle. Uh oh, oh, oh. It's doing that thing. Then, like, yeah. that thing that's um, what? Yeah. Basically, are the rectangles you're drawing supposed to be infinitesimally small? Are the rectangles supposed to be infinitesimally. infinitesimally. What's that word? Infinitesimally. Oh, that wouldn't work. Let's make this rectangle go up to here, right? And then another rectangle. You don't have to draw this, but I'm just trying to show you. Okay? But I could basically take a bunch of rectangles and add them all up, right? And what Cameron said, yes, if I made them infinitesimally small, right, then I could actually calculate the exact area under that curve because I could approximate that curve and that. And that area under there would be the definite integral. Now, to approximate the definite integral, we do use rectangles, all right? So for instance, say I want to, um, now I'm stealing the example from the book. Um, sorry, not give me a new sheet of paper. Moby board is messing up because I'm trying to record. Maybe Shay was meant to be to this. Good. I can't even do this. I can take this. <laughs> and I want you to take. Can you read my writing up there? What if a particle that says particle travels along the x-axis according to the equation v of t equals t squared? How far has it gone after three seconds? So what you could do is model this. So I should use my straight line tool. Here's y equals or or v of t v of t equals t squared. So one way I could do this is, what I really want to find is the area under this curve. Do you guys understand that? Okay. And so I want to find this area here. And it's impossible to kind of figure out exactly what well, is isn't impossible until you learn the, the fundamental theorem. It's not <coughs> possible. But if I want to do this, I could divide it up into rectangles kind of like this, right? I could make one rectangle here, one rectangle here, and one rectangle here. Would that be an overestimate or an underestimate? That'd be an overestimate, right? So I could I could divide I want to if I want to get more accurate, kind of like Cameron suggested, I could divide up rectangles here, right? I could go so I could say that this is uh, two here, this is one, and I could divide it up into into six rectangles, is that right? Four. Right? One, two, three, four, five, six. But where we're gonna do, we're gonna divide it up into 12 rectangles, just to get an estimate, right? And then to find that area, you can actually calculate it by, there's a couple different ways to calculate, but the way that they do it to get the most 
to get the most accurate answer, you take the middle of each one of the, these rectangles. Okay, so if I want to draw, see how if I draw a rectangle right here, actually that's not a very good. Let me see. If I draw a rectangle, I should look at the picture and look better. But if I draw, if I draw the middle, the height of that rectangle, I can get kind of close to the actual area. So if this is the height of the rectangle, the middle of each one of those boxes, okay? So if I draw a line across here, like that, a line across here, now as, get, as the curve gets steeper, can you see that I'm overestimating some area, but over here I'm kind of underestimating some? So I'd be pretty close to the actual area by finding the midpoints of each one of those ridges. So if I draw, so here's the curve, right? And say I use this, here's the, I'll blow it up, okay? Here's the rectangle that I want to find the area of. If they're bad, bad pictures, but if I made a rectangle right here using the midpoint of that rectangle, here I'd be cutting off some area, you see? But here I'd be adding some area. So kind of the best way to do it is by finding the middle. You understand? Okay. And the way I would do that mathematically is to um, make a table of values. So, um, so, so just for the first four rectangles, the way I might do it is um, put, so here's the interval, the, well, my eraser's not working. Where's my eraser? We need to get the bugs out of these Moby words. Is this an eraser? Are yes. they, are they Moby bugs? Moby bugs, they are. Um, so intervals, so say for instance, interval, I went from zero, to one fourth would be my first interval, and then my next interval would be from uh, one fourth to one half, and then my next interval would be from one half to three fourths, and then my next interval would be from three fourths to one. So what I'm talking about is just these four rectangles right here. You understand that? Okay, and, uh, and then the, you would take the midpoint, to do this mathematically, I'm not going to do it because it's going to take too much time, but then to find the midpoint of all those, the midpoint would be one half, no, one eighth, sorry, one eighth, oh, come on, erase, would be one eighth here, okay, and then this midpoint would be halfway between one fourth and one half. What was that, three eighths? Three eighths? And then this <coughs> midpoint would be halfway between here and here, which would be five eighths. And this midpoint would be halfway between here and here, which would be, I believe, seven eighths. And then what you do is you take V of each of these things. So if I take the V of T, V of one eighth, I get out, um, 1 over 64, 1 over 64. And if I take V of 3 eighths, I get 9 over 64. And if, because I'm just plugging these numbers into my, my, uh, this equation right here, and here I get 25 over 64. And then I get 49 over 64. And this V of T represents the height of each one of these rectangles, okay? And then what do I need to multiply that height by to find the area? How wide is each one of these rectangles? One fourth. One, uh, one fourth. So I would take these things, so I take all my, the sum of the V of T's, right? And then I multiply them by one fourth. You understand? What that, that symbol means summation. And I would do that from n equals um, 1 to n equals 
3. Then I'd add up all those, I'd add up all those rectangles and I'd come up with the area under that curve. And if I did that, I'd get that that is approximately equal to 8.98. And that would represent um, units, whatever the units have to be. So if I added all these up, and I went up, not, so I just showed you the first four rectangles, but you'd have to add up 12 rectangles and multiply by the width of each one, which is one fourth. And you would, so I'm adding this rectangle plus this, plus this, plus this, and add them all up. I would get about 8.95 units. Yes, sir. Do we take the sum first and then multiply by one fourth? Or it doesn't matter. You can multiply each one by, it's easier to take the sum first yeah. and then multiply by Yes, Joe. Would you get the one fourth? Because if each one of the, if I have three, say I want 12 rectangles, right? And it's three units from here to here, right? So if I got, divide three by 12, I get out one fourth. See? Okay, so that's how wide, if I wanted six rectangles, I would take three and divide by six, and that means each rectangle would be one half of a unit wide. If I wanted three rectangles, how wide would each one be? One. One, right? And it turns out that the more rectangles I have, the more accurate it's going to be, right? Do you understand that idea? Hello? So, um, so then we're going to talk about the this thing called the RAM. Red. And this is called the rectangle rectangle approximation method. And this is all we're gonna approximation method. And in this book they have something called and I've never really uh, they just abbreviate it. So they have something called an LRAM. An LRAM. And then you have something called a R RAM. And then you have something called an M RAM. And what these things, this is a left endpoint, left endpoint approximation. And I'll show you the difference. And this is right endpoint, endpoint. And this is a midpoint approximation. And that's what I just showed you, a midpoint approximation. So say, for example, I have a <coughs> so, okay, so what that means is left endpoint, if I had this same curve and I want to do an approximation from here to here, I could start my rectangles at the left endpoint. So this first one would actually have zero area, and the second one would have would have a little bit under the amount of area that I need, and the next one would be a little bit underneath as well. These are this would be like a left endpoint approximation. If I'm going like this and like this and like this, and then like this. Whoops, one more rectangle didn't fit. And then like this. Yeah, so this is a L RAM, left end point. An R RAM would look like, I would start, so if my interval were say one half, so say this were the first one, I would start here and use my height as the right end point of that rectangle. So I would go one half, then one, then three halves, and it looks like that, right? And then we already talked the midpoint rectangles. I would start at one fourth and so on and so forth. You understand the difference between right and left and where rectangles? Do you understand that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So left and point. So say I want. So say my interval is. Interval, let's change it because it's say the interval is uh, interval is six units. Okay? 
and I want a left endpoint. Left endpoint. The first one, and say I want six rectangles. Yes. I would start out with my first one at zero, and then my next one would start at one, and my next one would start at two, and my next one would start at three, four, five, and and uh, then you'd stop because this one would go from zero to one. Next one would go from the first one would go from zero to one. Next one, that's good. The next one would go from one. Come on, eraser. So the first rectangle would go from zero to one. The next one would go from one to two. The next one would go from two to three. Next one go to three to four. Next one go to four to five. The next one go to five to six. And then you'd stop. There's one rectangle with no area. Two, three, four, five, and six rectangles. Okay. If I did right and point rectangles using the same thing, my first one would start. My first one would start at one, and so I go. So it'd be an overestimate, and then my next one would be at two. My next one would be at three, four, five, and my last one would <laughs> my last one would stop here at six. Okay, so I still have six rectangles: one rectangle, two rectangle, three rectangle, four rectangle, five, one, five, and six. But in this case, I'm using the right endpoint as the height of the rectangle. In this case, I'm using the left endpoint as the height of the rectangle. So here I'm starting at zero. Here I'm starting at one and going to six. Here I'm starting at zero and going to five, but I still have six rectangles. All right. And then the midpoint, you would start at one half, right? If I want to do a mid, so this would be right. This would be a R ram, R ram, and then I'd have an M ram. If I want to do the same thing, I think this is the best way to do it. Six. Six rectangles. It would look like it would, the first one would start at one half, right? And that would be the height of your first rectangle. And then the next one would go to three halves, and that would be the next one, okay? And the next one would go here, which would be five halves, I believe, right? And the next one would be at seven halves over here until you get to, um, and the next one would be a hat, which is two. And then you go to, you get that? Yes? No? All right, so um, how, so let's do it with a specific, with a specific function. And I'm gonna do something different than what they did in the book because it's a little bit, um, the numbers, the num they have a program that does this for you, okay? but why can't, I, just integrate it? why can't you just integrate it? Because this is the basis of integration. You have to appreciate this integration, okay? <laughs> um, find, <laughs> just like you had to do the, uh, the limit process to find derivatives at first. And plus, this stuff yeah, is on the eight. It's the worst process, process of all time. I don't know how to do it. But yeah, but, like but, but this is it. part of the AP curriculum to know how to find areas under curve it's using reg way to do it. Okay, and so because uh, it's part of the theory. Okay, for f of x, find the area under the curve. For f of x equals um, x squared x squared times sine of x on the interval 0 to 3 using 6 should we call it left end point? 6 um, Left. Now let's go midpoint. If you average the left endpoint and the right endpoint, do you get the middle endpoint? 
No. Yeah, I understand. Six midpoint rectangles. Okay. So, so the values, so the x values that we're going to plug in. First thing they want to do is find the width of the interval. So the width. Since I'm going from 0 to 3, how do I do that? 3 divided by 6. So the width is 1 half. Do you understand? So that's how wide each rectangle is going to be. The x values are going to start. So the interval, first of all, the interval, my eraser, it's frustrating that my eraser's in here. Okay? The intervals. Are going to be from uh, zero to one half, right? And then from one half to one, right? And then from one to three halves. I'm just going up by a half each time. And then from three halves to two, and then from two to two and a half, five halves. Is that six yet? One. Whoops, that should be a comma there, not a parenthesis, sorry. Ah. And then from one half to one, that's one, two, three, four, five, and then from five halves up to three. All right, so that would make six intervals where you're finding areas of rectangles. And then the midpoints, midpoints are going to be one fourth. Then a half a unit away from one fourth is three fourths. Then a half away a unit from there would be is that five fourths. And then half a unit away from there would be seven fourths. Let's leave it all like this. And nine fourths and eleven fourths. Okay, so those are the midpoints. Now you want to see how to do this on your calculator? Because you don't want to add these things up each time, because it drives you kind of Alright, okay? So what you want to do is you want to do um, the sum of the midpoints, sum of the f of one fourth plus f of three fourths plus f of five fourths, right? Plus dot, 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 f of 11 fourths. And then what I want to do is take that and multiply it by the width of the interval, which is 1 half. So this is what I want to do on my calculator. You understand why I want to do that? How I find there? Good. So now what you do is you take your calculator, and first you have to put the equation into your calculator. Um, the other thing, since this is a sine function, I want to make sure that I'm in, uh, at least for this one, I want to be in uh, radian mode. Okay? Do always in front. Clear. Look at that mess. Always doing. How do I close that down? Okay. So first I'm going to go y equals, put my function in there. Uh, x squared sine of x. x squared sin x. Alright. Then I'm going to go to my stat. Second quid. Go to stat. And I'm going to go to edit. And I'm going to clear out my list one and list two. Clear like that. And I'm going to go up here. And then clear, clear that out. And now I have my list one, list two. So I'm going to put in those values that I have. Whoa, what's that doing? I'm going to put in those values one fourth, three fourths, five fourths. So let's do it. I guess I could do it as a decimal. It's easier, right? 0.25 and uh, 0.75. Tell me if I mess up. 0.75s, 